Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of 15 Minutes to Merge. I'm April Edwards, and I'm a senior developer advocate at GitHub. Now, I'm also a HashiCorp ambassador, and with us today, I have a very special guest and good friend, Ned Bellavant. Welcome, Ned. Hey, April. How you doing? I'm doing great. It is great to have you on the show today. And as a fellow Hashi ambassador, we both work a lot with Terraform and a lot of the other HashiCorp products. So would you go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone and tell, tell people what it is you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm Ned Bellavance. NedInTheCloud.com is the website you can find all my things on. And I guess if you asked what I do, I try to teach people about technical things in a fairly entertaining way. And sometimes I'm successful. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about infrastructure as code. Well, more specifically, creating our first repository in GitHub. But we're going to use infrastructure as code, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the example code that we're going to be working with. And the, the main idea here is... Let's say I've started working with infrastructure as code locally for a little while, and I'm realizing, hey, maybe saving it to my local drive is not the best place to store that code. I should treat it, you know, like like code. And where That's do you put cool. code? You put it in a version control repository. And for our example, we'll be using GitHub. But, you know, this kind of works with any repository system out there. Absolutely. And I think it's critical we put it into source control and version control it so we know exactly when we made changes, we can control it. And there's lots of other things we can do. But more importantly, let's get our infrastructure's code into GitHub. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to go over a few of the benefits of why you would even want to do this. I mean, first, it's just like protecting yourself from losing all your code because your hard drive went bad or you lost your laptop. So that's not great. But also you can do cool things like share that code with other people or keep versions of it. So if you make a mistake or something doesn't work out right, you can roll, roll back to a previous version and restore that version in your tree. So there's that's a few of the benefits. There's plenty more that we could get into, but why don't we go with the demo instead? Sounds good. Let's take it away. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do and the first thing that you would do is create a repository on GitHub to store your code. So I have GitHub open in my browser. I'm gonna to go to the repositories and we're gonna create a new repository here. I'll click on the new button. And from our repository name, ooh, let's call this burrito truck. Love mm, it. I could use a burrito. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, we're gonna make this a public repository, which means anybody can see the contents of the repository. They can't change it, but they can see it. If you don't care for that, you can set it to private, but I'm gonna leave it as public. We can add a readme file, which describes the purpose of this repository. And then below that is a very important item, which is the gitignore file. And we'll get into the gitignore file, what its purpose is and what you should be putting in it. But I'm just gonna click the button and select Terraform from the list of available templates. There we go. And lastly, we have to select a license. Now, my favorite license is the MIT license, but you know, use whatever license you enjoy. And finally, click on Create Repository. Now, since there's not really any code in our repository yet, it does populate it with some files because we said, I want to read me. Our readme's there. We, we wanted a license, so the license file is there, and we wanted a gitignore. So the gitignore file is all there. Now, how do I take this repository and start working with it locally? Fortunately, that's really easy. You click on the drop down code and it gives you a clone link. You can click on that to copy it to your clipboard. And then we're gonna jump over to the terminal and we're going to clone this repository locally. So that just creates a local folder. That's a copy of this code, along with some other details on how to connect it back to the GitHub repository that it's associated with. I'll head on over to the terminal and the command we're gonna run is git clone. So you already have to have the git, the git command line tool installed. If you need to know how to do that, we'll include a link down in the description for how to install git locally. I'm gonna type git clone and then paste in the clone link that it gave me. And when I hit enter, it's gonna create a subdirectory called burrito truck that has all the files that we were just looking at. So I'll go into that directory and do a quick ls. There's our gitignore, there's our license, and our readme. So if I want to start editing this code, I'm going to run code to fire up VS Code with the period to do in the current working directory, and that'll fire up an instance of Visual Studio Code. Let me bump that up a little bit. And it has our three files, and because 
there's a hidden directory that has all the GitHub information. It's already wired into GitHub. If I want to make changes locally, I can do that. And then I would commit those changes locally and push them up to the remote repository. So that's the workflow if I had no files yet. I just wanted to create my repository and start writing code in it. But there's definitely going to be occasions where you have code that you've already written and you just want to create a repository and push that code up into it. So the workflow is a little bit different for that. And I thought I would walk through that workflow as well, if that sounds good to you, April. Absolutely, because I think often if we've been doing some of the stuff locally on our machines with infrastructure as code, great, but we've saved it all locally or maybe a shared file. Um, and we need to get that into GitHub because also a lot of times we're migrating projects that might be hosted locally. Absolutely. So back in my terminal, I'm going to create a new directory here and we'll call this one uh, Taco Wagon. We've got right. our burrito truck and our Taco Wagon. And I'll go into Taco Wagon and I'll create a new file using the new item command since I'm in PowerShell and create a main.tf that would, in theory, ho hold our code. And I'll fire up VS Code again to get into there. Okay, so now we have our main.tf. There's nothing in there yet, but that's okay. What we're going to do is we're now going to create a repository in GitHub and we're going to push this file up into GitHub. So I'm going to go back to my browser. And we'll go back to the main page for my account and to repositories. And we're going to create a new repository. This one's going to be called Taco Wagon. Love it. Can we get hot sauce as well? <laughs> and in this case, I'm not going to add anything to the repository because I already have files I want to push up to it. So the only all I'm going to do is click on create repository here, and that will create just the shell of the repository that I want to use. Now I need to go back to the terminal and add this file and also configure the association between this repository and my local one. So I'm going to go back to my terminal. I'm already in the right directory. So let me just clear it so it's a little easier to see what's going on here. And I'm going to run a command called git init. And that initializes this directory as a git repository. And I'm going to specify the branch name and I'm going to call it main. So I'll do that first. And now we have a git repository in our location. Excellent. Next, I'm going to add my main.tf file. And if I had any other files in there as well, using git add. So this adds this to the database that git keeps of all the files that are in your repository. Next thing I'll do is add git commit dash m because you need a message with every commit. And I'll say first commit here. Now I've committed my file to the GitHub repository. And then the last thing to do is make the association between this repository and the remote one that I had. So I'm going to run git remote add. And then I have the special name of it is origin. So I'm adding an origin repository. And now the remote URL of that repository. I'm going to type it and then I'll say it. And also for everyone watching, if you want to get that URL, that is from the GitHub, uh, the GitHub page where you actually set that up. So you can literally copy and paste the URL right where Ned has done it. So you don't have to type it out because we all know that when we type stuff, we make mistakes because we're humans. I do make mistakes all the time. So yes. thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Now we've made that association between our local repository and the remote repos repository. So the last thing to do is push our file up to that remote repository. So I'll do that. I'm pushing it now. And after a second, boom, that file has been pushed up to our remote repository. And all I have to do is refresh the view here. And I should see there's my main.tf. Awesome. So if you had an existing code base, you'd basically follow those same steps. And when you did git add with the dot, that would add all the files that are in that directory so far. And then you're just pushing them up. And now the two are tracking each other and you can start using your existing code with version control. Uh, one last thing that I want to mention is the git ignore file and why it's so important. There are plenty of files in your Terraform configuration that you might not want to add to the repository, especially if it's public. 
One of those big ones is the TF state file. So if you happen to be using local state, you don't want to commit that because that can often contain sensitive information. What the dot git ignore file does is it tells git if any files match these patterns, don't commit them to source control. So the predefined template that's on GitHub for Terraform includes the TF state file. It also includes the dot Terraform directory, which is where all of your modules and your provider plugins get downloaded, as well as your Terraform state configuration if you're using a remote state. Again, some of that could be sensitive and some of that you just don't want cluttering up your repository. So probably a good idea to include that as well. Um, it also exempts any TF vars files because those could also have sensitive information that you don't want exposed in your public repository. And one other one that's not included by default, but you may want to consider is TF plan. So if you're running a lot of Terraform plans locally and using the extension .tf plan, you may want to include that as well because the plan file can also contain sensitive information and it doesn't really need to be in source control. Absolutely. Uh Ned, this has been great. This is great to see how we can start net new with the Terraform project, their infrastructure's code in GitHub, and also how we can import our files in the GitHub. So it's been really, really helpful. So Ned, awesome. thank you so much for coming on the show. As always, it's a pleasure to work with you and to see you here. Thanks so much, April. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. We'll put links in the description for everything Ned showed today, also some getting started documents. So go ahead, get started and let us know how you got on creating your first Git repository. So see you all next time on 15 Minutes to Merge.